everybody. Welcome to another episode of Voices of Recovery. I'm your host, Michelle Ike, and every week I interview somebody who's overcome a life-controlling issue with God's help, and today I'm interviewing Ted. Ted, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And as you can see, we're in a little bit of a different setting. Uh, Ted wanted to meet in person, and so we're doing that. We're at the church, and we're just going to go ahead and have a little conversation. Sound good? good? Yes. Awesome. 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 So, um, Ted, introduce yourself to the audience. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name's Ted Bear, and I've, uh, I'm married, got three sons, and we got seven, t- uh, nine grandkids. And um, I live on an old farm, and I'm still working, and I'm just kind of enjoying myself, actually. That's beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing that. And Ted grows really amazing sweet corn too, which you didn't mention, but uh, that's amazing. So, all right, well, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, You shared recently at a Celebrate Recovery meeting and you shared a little bit about your testimony. And so I asked you if you'd be interested in coming on the show and uh, you graciously agreed to do that. but you shared that you struggled with an alcohol mm-hmm. addiction yes, for many correct. years. So let's, um, let's go back in time a little bit and tell us kind of how that got started and how it progressed to becoming a problem. Okay, I started out, I, I lived on a horse farm and my dad had a, he sold tax, so like saddles and all this stuff. So in this saddle shop, we had, and like a pot machine, but we put beer in it mostly. So at a young age, I was had beer all the time. I could just have beer anytime I wanted to drink one. So it was just kind of accepted, I guess, that everybody just went along with it. But mm-hmm. it can, but really, as soon as I started drinking, I knew there was something different, and I couldn't nail it. But I knew I there was something going on. Well. It was probably when I was about 16 years old, we used, to, we used to camp out all the time. We would yeah. take our horses with us and camp out overnight. Well, we snuck a bunch of beer back in the woods. Mm. And we were carrying it over this gate and we dropped a, a, a whole case. And there was like three of them left. And I drank like two of them. And I knew right then that all my buddies didn't, they didn't think nothing of it, but I was the one who was grabbing more to drink. Mm-hmm. And I knew from that point in my life that I, that I had a problem. Okay. The, the best thing that I, I played baseball and, and in school, so I couldn't drink at school because, you know, to stay eligible. Right. I, I couldn't do anything like that. So I kind of controlled, let's, let's say controlled my drinking until I got older. And then when, when I got, I got married and, and uh, it, I just went, I was out of control. Mm. I was totally out of control. And I didn't even know, like, it was so, it was so bad that I was blacking out. Mm. And my dad had a, a fuel business and we sold gasoline and all that. And I actually lost the gas truck load at one time. Wow. I was so drunk. Wow. So that just tells, okay. you know, my story. You guys understand that I was really bad. Okay, so let's just pause there for a minute, Ted, and back up a bit. You said you knew something was different. Yes. When you drank your first beers, and this was at a fairly young age. Yes. Were how old? I'd I'd say 14, 15 years old, somewhere in that groove. Okay, and so looking back now on those experiences, what do you think was different? Well, you know, I I hear a lot of people say that they drank because their dad, they watched their parents drink so much and, Mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and I disagree. I disagree with all that because that's a cop out for me to say that I drank because of my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad never made me drink anything. I drank, I drank myself. Oh, okay. So my dad was not in the picture at all, but I could just tell when I I felt different when I drank Mm -hmm. versus when I didn't drink. Mm -hmm. And I really can't nail it. I really wish I had something to tell you that I do, but I don't, I don't really know what it was, but I know there was something. Okay. And you bring up a good point because I think a lot of people want to blame something or someone. And there are definitely 
different things that happen to us in life that can lead us to the choices that we make. But at the end of the day, there are choices. Right. Right. Correct. And so that's a huge part of recovery is accepting responsibility for your own choices. Yes. Maybe these things happen when we were younger and maybe they were horrific things and we don't want to make light of that at all. But the question is, what am I going to do about it? Correct. Correct. So do you think the difference was that you were an alcoholic, that it, it affected you differently? In other words, um, a lot of 14 and 15 year olds drink, right? They mm -hmm. experiment with alcohol. Um, they sneak a beer or whatever when they're getting it for their dad. Um, or so I've heard. But, um, <laughs> you know, maybe the difference for you was um, that you really couldn't stop. I mean, it wasn't just a beer or two. You mentioned that it led to blackouts. It led to, sure. it led to problems. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. And then I would say I'm going to quit every day. And then by the end of the day, I was back doing it. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So it was definitely causing problems in your life, probably with relationships, with work. Yes. You lose a truck. That's kind yes. of a big deal. It lost my first wife left because she mm. said I drank too much. Wow. And which was really hard because I had three sons and mm -hmm. that really, that put me in a mess. And I realized at that time that I had to stop mm. or I would lose my sons all for, forever. And wow. I didn't want that to happen. Yeah, that's, those are some very high stakes. And, but I want to share something that's really important that everybody needs to hear. Is that when I was going to go to quit drinking, I knew a guy that I drank with for years that quit mm -hmm. and I would run into him all over and he, we used to buy these huge beers that were in these big tubs and then he would just put iced tea in them. So when he had iced tea in them, I checked his cup all the time for a year. <laughs> I checked this guy's cup. Okay. So what I want people to realize is that there's people that watch you when you get into these programs mm. because they need help. And they're not going to come right out and ask because right. they're watching what you do. Mm. And I watched this man for a year and I watched this man change in a year. Wow. So I, I, what I did is uh, I, I played a lot of softball and I traveled all over. So I was at a tournament. I said, I'm going to drink one beer and I'll be all right. You know, if I just drink one, I'm good. Right. Well, no, I, I don't know how many I had. And I went home and said, that's it. I'm done. Okay. So I called this guy up. That was on a Sunday night. Mm -hmm. I called this guy up and he goes, I'll take you to a meeting right now. And I'm going, <laughs> I don't have to go today. Mm -hmm. But later on in the week, so I went Tuesday night and it changed my life. Without wow. a doubt, it changed my life. It was, uh, you know, it, uh, I, I just felt comfortable sitting there that I knew they were like me. And, and uh, I never had that before. Wow. You know, because when you drink, <laughs> People don't realize you go hang out with people that drink like you because sure. if you, you can't go out and drink with somebody that's going to drink one beer and quit, you mm -hmm. know? So it's, it's, it, it, that's how it kind of works. So I, this guy kind of led me around and, and, and uh, I, I stay, I hung around with him for a couple of years, but then I passed him. If you understand what I mean, mm -hmm. is he one, but he wasn't drinking. So he, he still to this day is not drinking. Right. And by the way, I've got 29 years sober. Wow. So, so this guy's got 30 years now. Yeah. And he's still sober, and I still see him all the time. Congratulations. So, that's so it's pretty, it's really kind of neat. Coming up on 30 yeah. years, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ted, uh, you mentioned that you were watching this guy. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you weren't watching him, like, to see if he would fall or to see if he would slip. You were, like, checking out to see if he was the real deal. Yeah, exactly. You're absolutely right. That's what I, I wanted. I didn't care if he would, you know, if he would have had a beer there, it had been, right. it had been okay with me. You know, I'd been all right with that. Right. But I just seen his life change and he, and he was doing it the right way. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So you kind of realize that you can't just have one beer oh, no. and you realize that there's a problem and yeah. then you went to a meeting. So what kind of a meeting was that? Was it? It was an A meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, it was right down the street from here. My first meeting was in. And you said it changed your life. How, how did that happen? Because I knew I had a problem when I talked to them. And they say that in, in AA, you're, you're supposed to say, I'm an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. 
And you know what? It's really hard to say mm. because you're really defining your life. If you say you're an alcoholic, right. it's what you are. Mm. Well, I said it the first time because I knew, I knew, I, I knew it. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody had to tell me that I drank mm -hmm. too much. I knew it. Sure. So it just changed my outlook. And then when these guys talked to me, it cha just changed. It changed my attitude on, on so much stuff. Awesome. Well, you know, saying it um, kind of breaks that denial. Yes. Because we know that people in recovery or people with addictions or other life controlling issues can be in deep, deep denial. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And maybe you were there. No. And, uh, you know, I was there. And so it's nothing to be ashamed of, but I think just taking that step and admitting it is huge because when you admit it, then you can kind of take responsibility for it and say, now what am I going to do about it? Exactly. And you brought up another point that I kind of wanted to highlight. You talked about the people you hung out with. You know, um, when you were drinking, you were around other people who were drinking as much as you. Yes. Because that's kind of what we do, right? Yeah. The old saying, birds of a feather flock together. You know, we we feel comfortable and we want to be around people who are like us. And it's, it's a normal human trait. Um, but it can also get us into a lot of trouble. So I think, and you can address this um, for our audience, but the people you hang around with the company you keep and the Bible talks about this, you know, mm -hmm. is huge. And, um, it's very hard to do this alone. Um, but when you're surrounded with other people who are on the same journey as you, I think there's comfort in that and you can encourage each other. So talk a little bit about that if you would. Probably one of the, the weirdest things about all this is like all the people that I used to hang around with and the people at AA would tell me you will learn to change your friends because mm -hmm. they handle, your situation. And what I always noticed is when I was around my old friends, I would get that butterfly would come back in my belly mm. and it, it scared me because that was, okay. that's a trigger for me. I know. And it still is today. Mm -hmm. So when I get that, I got to leave. And if you ever, like, if I ever tell you that, you'll see me sitting there, I will leave. I will get up and walk out okay. because that to me is my trigger to, to, to quit. I, I, that's, I just can't be around people. But I never thought I could get rid of some of my friends because they were like really close friends. Right. And I realized with time, the Holy Spirit just changes your friends without you even knowing it. Mm. And all of a sudden, you know, cause there's still guys that I would still 30 years later, like to talk to and see them. And I, but we have nothing in common anymore. Right. Cause they still go out and party out all the time. And I don't. Right. So there's no sense for me really seeing them because I really don't have nothing to say to them. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sure. About Yet, if those people reach out to you and wanted help, you would be right there. I'll be there. right there. Yeah. You know, I have helped some of my friends. And, uh, yeah. Oh, awesome. yeah, absolutely. Be right there for them. Yeah. yeah. That's, what we're, that's what we're here for. It's very important. Sure. You know, I'm thinking about helping other people who are kind of still stuck in the mess. It reminds me of trying to save a drowning person. You know, um, if you don't know what you're doing, that drowning person will pull you under. Absolutely. And you'll drown too. Absolutely. So you have to be careful. And it sounds like that butterfly feeling is kind of like God, you know, we say it's a God instinct or a gut feeling, but um, it's God's way of telling us and warning us. Yes. It's time to go. Yeah. It's time to and, go. And you, when you stay around, like, you know, you can kind of figure out when people are lying and, you know, we're, we know what that's like. Cause right. we've been there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, trying to lie to a person like me is like, it's kind of a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I'll just go, okay, whatever. You know, right. We'll just walk away. Right. Okay. That's great, Ted. Okay. Um, so when I heard you talk, you recalled an incident where you were in a bar and I think you'd been sober for five years. Yes. About five years. Yeah. You were sober for five years and you went into a bar and you were going to get drunk. Yeah. So. I, I can't believe you remember that like that. Yeah. Yes. It's very, it's, it's true. And it really the strange, the strangest part about the whole thing was, is, well, the bar's gone now, but I, I never hung out. It was on the other side of town. Mm -hmm. I, I never went over there, but I went right to that bar mm -hmm. and went right on in. And like I was telling you, it had the old phone booth in it. And uh, I called somebody and it, and it, it in a phone booth. In that phone wow. booth, 
I called somebody. We don't do that anymore, do we? I don't even, yeah. I haven't seen one in years. But. No, especially like this. This right. was really a cool, like all wooden one inside this box. Okay. So you could, they could, nobody could even hear me talk inside. Mm. So I got a hold, I, I, I tried to call two of my sponsors, couldn't get a hold of them. So I called the next number, which I had is, is a woman, and I called her. Mm. And she said, well, why don't you wait till I get there? And I said, well, I can't wait that long. And she goes, well, if it's worth, if it's worth drinking, it'd be wor wait, worth waiting for me. Right. So she said, you go out to your car and just go out there and, and think about stuff and pray. And I'm going, okay, I don't really got to pray and stuff down yet, but I will go out in the car. Mm -hmm. When I went out in the car, the urge was gone. Really? Yeah, it was gone. I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to, didn't go back in at all. Hmm. Just, just, I just, actually, I just drove off. Did something trigger the trip to the bar after five years of being sober, I, or you just I, yes, on a, some okay. triggered it, but I don't really know what it was. Okay. It just it was like a light, a light came on, mm -hmm. and I was following that light. It's, it's the best way of putting it. Okay, so she gave you good sound advice. Yes, you spent some time in the car, and yes. you kind of realized what am I doing here? Yes, awesome. Yes. Okay, another thing that you mentioned when I heard you speak, Ted, is you said that you couldn't find God. Right. So that kind of piqued my interest a little bit. Um, tell us about how you felt in that journey of trying to find God and not feeling like you were able to find him. My feeling on finding God is that I hope everybody finds him right away and not like I do. I did. Because without God, you're not, you're going to really struggle. And I know like that five, that when I went out, if, if I probably had God on my side, I, I probably wouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. It was just that I was smart enough mm -hmm. and had enough time and enough tools that people taught me what to do. I did. I called. And that's what saved me. But I went on and I watched people. You got to realize, man, I watched people and I listened. Mm -hmm. and, and for people like us, that's probably one of the main things we can do is listen to people because mm -hmm. we will learn more if you just listen. Right. Because we've made a lot of bad habits and a lot of bad traits we've done. So mm -hmm. we have to figure out how to get past sure. all of that. So, uh, man, I kind of asked me something cause I kind of lost my thought on that. We I were talking about, to. it's okay. It's all right. We were talking about how you couldn't find God. Oh, wait a minute. They got it back. So, <laughs> I, I watched all these people and I, I, I know a guy that was around AA for like 20 years and man, he knew that book inside and out. He could tell you everything you wanted to hear, mm -hmm. but he couldn't live it because he couldn't find God. Mm. And he passed away from, he overdosed wow. and he passed away because I really believe that you got to have God. If you can't find him, you're going to have problems in this. Right. You better hang on and hang on mm -hmm. tight. Like I did. I did do it. So after, I, after my divorce and all that stuff, and, and you knew I had to quit drinking, I, I did. I really took it serious. I knew I had to quit. So I, I moved into actually the house that I'm living in now. I ended up buying my farm, but I, 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 my grandpa owned it, and he needed somebody to fix it up. So he let me move in. And that was probably one of the neatest times of my life that I never even knew, that, but God was right there. I'm almost ready to cry because I mean, God was there with me and I didn't know it. I, I couldn't find you, but he was there because I would go over and sit with my grandpa. I didn't have any money because my child support and everything mm -hmm. took all my money. Mm -hmm. So I would sit there, I would go over with my grandpa and talk with him. And what a, just what a learning experience I had. Yes. So I struggled and I kept struggling. People, I struggled for a long time. And then I met this lady. Um, I, had a, I had a lady cleaning my house. And they redid my whole yard with, with mulch and all that. Well, there's another lady that did that. So I took them out to eat. Well, the one lady didn't go. And the other one, I ended up marrying her. And I always said I never want anybody from the program. And she's in the program. So I kind of mentioned it to her. She knew that I couldn't find find him and uh, you know she was like praying with me and all that stuff and so when we were going to get married so you guys I'm talking you know this is like like almost another five years stretch okay but I'm, I'm getting it so it's like almost 10 years now that I'm really you know 
he makes me go to an alpha course. I don't know if you ever heard of an alpha yeah, course. Yeah, my husband and I have actually led alpha groups. So yeah. We're familiar with it. So I never forget, I was sitting in the back of this alpha group, and, I, and I, you got to realize, it's as far in the back as you can get, it just sat in the back corner. And some reason I said, it's enough, God. You got to come. I need you now. And these people are really helping me. And the best way I could tell anybody that was in a situation I was in is it's like going over and open the door up, like open that door and say, God, just, just come on in. Mm -hmm. And you're amazing. It's amazing what he does. If you just ask him just to come in the door, he'll be there. Mm -hmm. So I, I went on that alpha weekend and I came back from the alpha weekend and I went, wow, you know, man, I was flying. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even touch ground for probably three or four <laughs> days. But then I had to go to Emmaus the following weekend. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, God, you can't do no more than what <laughs> you've already done for me. You, right. can't, you can't do it. It's just out of the question. Well, I went there and there was a guy right away that picked on me because, you know, I, I'm just one that don't like rules. I, and I never have. <laughs> and to this day, I still don't. I'll fight you if I can over a rule. And this guy was like picking on me and, and, and uh, he was like going like this, like, you know what? I said, listener, you can't even catch up with me when I take off. So I don't even know why you're wasting your time. Yeah. But I said, I tell you what, if I had a vehicle, I would be gone. Mm. And I remember fighting it that, that Thursday night. I fought it so bad. And I got up, uh, got up on Friday morning and I said, you know what? This man's not going to bother me today. I said, Jesus, you got me and mm -hmm. do what you want. And that's when my life got just boom. I, it blew me away. It just wow. totally blew me away. Wow. And I always said, don't ever put anything. Let it, let it just be easy. Let me be that bar, back seat person and right. just leave me alone. Yeah. And I'll come. And man, was that a joke? Because he turned me in. Because I did the alpha leaders too and all that nice. stuff. So, you know, it's just amazing how he changed my life. I can't imagine you as a wallflower, Ted. No. <laughs> no, he knew that too. Yeah. But uh, no. It's amazing. That's a beautiful story. So do you think in looking back in those years when you couldn't find God that you were just making it too hard? Yes. I really don't know what I was thinking and what I was doing. And because how, when he really came into my life, it was just as simple as opening that door. And he was there. You know, right. and, but, but I really say, I have to say, like it was a lot to do with my wife. Because like the pastors and all that, the people I worked with, they all said, no, you need to go home and pray with your wife. And, you know, it was all this little stuff all added up. And mm -hmm. that's when I found him. So Beautiful. because the pastor is the one that made me go to the alpha group and all that stuff. Okay. Before he would marry us, he said, you got to go because he said, you're such a boy. <laughs> and I, I agree. I, you know, I agree with him. I agree. Mm -hmm. You're right. You know, because mm -hmm. I will fight you if I can about anything. And, and, uh, yeah. Well, that is an interesting quality. And, and I think that when we're in our mess, it can certainly get us into trouble because we can be very stubborn and bullheaded and like, you know, well, I'm not going to listen and I'm not going to follow the rules. But when God gets a hold of you, um, you can use that bullheadedness for God. Absolutely. Because nobody's going to talk you out of Jesus. No, you're, you're absolutely set. right. You're set. Yeah. yeah. It's like the apostle Paul, you know, he was zealous for religion and then he became zealous for God. He yes. still had the same zeal, but it was just used for good. Yes. Yes. And I just feel like that's going to really bless somebody maybe that's watching today. You know, maybe you, you just can't figure God out and it's just too complicated and it seems too hard. And like Ted said, it's just as easy as opening a door and just asking him in. And God is a gentleman. Sure he is. He won't bulldoze us. And nope force himself on us, um, but he's waiting um, with anticipation for us to simply ask him to come in. And then that changes everything, right? Oh, yeah. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you uh, were speaking at Celebrate Recovery, and you're one of the team leaders for the Celebrate Recovery. Mm -hmm. And um, I watch you, and you're very real. Um, you're very compassionate and you always start off by reminding everybody that we don't judge. Yes. So one of the beautiful things about a lot of the people I interview 
is that not only do they get free, but they have a strong desire to see other people get free. So how did you become involved with Celebrate Recovery? And tell us a little bit about what you do and just what part that has, is playing in your life. I think I've been here about nine years, I think. And I've known Roseanne, uh, actually, I helped build Roseanne's house. Mm. All this house was amazing because it was all Christian people built it. That was it. Nice. And so I knew almost everybody there. It was kind of really, it was kind of a neat deal. Well, I was real big in AA and I still go to AA too. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, I, I still have a lot of friends in AA and, and I just wanted a little bit more because you know what, AA, you know, you can use this chair as your higher power if you want. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Don't get me wrong. That's okay. If it's keeping you sober at this time right now or clean mm -hmm. or whatever your hang up is, it's okay. But you have to move on. Right. You can't, you can't hold that forever. Mm -hmm. So when I found, when I, when I seen Roseanne, I went, I forget why, how she got me to come, but I went and they were down in uh, Cleves at the time. And I went down and I seen the hope because Jesus was there. Mm. The, the hope was there right out front. And I went, man, I really like this. Right. So I've been doing it ever since. And, and uh, yeah, I, I just, I never left because I just, I love how this, this program really works. Right. It works. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, it doesn't matter what your hangup is because they're all basically grouped into one. And that's how we, we help each other. And when I say, you know, I, I don't want anybody to come here and get, think they're going to get their feelings hurt because that's not how we operate. You know, we're not here to, to, to like grab you and teach you and make you do anything. Right. Because you can't make me do anything. Mm -hmm. So how can I make you? Right. Yeah. You know, because that's the way I am. So mm -hmm. I have to look at different angles of trying to help people. Because if anybody has any problem finding God, please call me. You know? Be glad because I don't want anybody to have to go through what I had to go through. Right. It took too long. Basically, it was kind of doing it on your own power versus leaning on God's power. Yes. To get that done. Yes. So I commend you for doing it on your in your own strength because that is not easy. No, but it wasn't. You're kind of getting easy. to the point where you needed God's strength. Yes. To help. Yeah, you. absolutely. I had an, I couldn't go anymore. I was done, and I think the Lord knew that. But the Lord was with me all the time. Right. But I didn't know that. Yeah. And and finally, when I asked him, he came because he knew I was done. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I don't know if I was going to go back out, but I sure was going crazy. Right. Yeah. And even with my wife there helping me, it wasn't helping. Right. You know. Yeah. So. That's one of the things I really like about Celebrate Recovery is that it's very clear that Jesus is the higher power. And it's, right, it's about him. And uh, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Because the chair can only do so much, right? <laughs> exactly. It, it, you're absolutely right. You can only take it so far. So, Ted, you've seen a lot of people come in and out of the program. Absolutely. You've been here nine years. Um, you've seen people's lives completely transformed. Absolutely. You've seen people who come in and maybe go back to the mess. Yep. What is it about the people who are successful? Or maybe I should ask, what are they doing to make sure that they move forward in their recovery and don't go back to the hurt, the habit, the hang up, which is whatever it is. recovery. And guess what? We all have a hurt habit or hang up. So it, everybody could benefit from coming, right? Not just mm -hmm. a quote unquote addiction, but um, how are people in your opinion successful? I think the first thing you got to be is it's in your attitude on what mm -hmm. you want to do. Because if you have a bad attitude, you're probably not going to make it. Mm. Uh, one thing that I like to, to tell people that I think is really important is if you're just starting, if you guys are, whoever's just starting right now, take a piece of paper and a pen and write down uh, things that you want to see happen in a year, things that you want to see change in your life the good or the bad, however you want to put this stuff, how you want to see the, 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 the bad things change too. Mm -hmm. And write it down and in a year, hide it or whatever somewhere and keep it and get it out in a year and you will not 
believe what happens. And I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit will bless you way over anything that you got put down on a piece of paper. You won't even be close. You'll be in a whole different a place than, than you think you would be in a year. But it's in your attitude. And you, you got to keep an open mind. It's like, you know, you got to learn how to listen to people. Mm. I think that's probably one of the other main ones. It's your attitude and listen, because you don't know. You know, I remember when I started going to A meetings, I was saying stuff one time and a guy told me, shut up. <laughs> yeah. And I looked at him and I, he was, shut up. You don't know what to say. You don't know nothing what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So just don't talk. Just listen. Wow. And it worked. And you know what he told me? He said, I said, man, you know what? You make me mad. I'm about to go back out drinking. And he goes, you know what? It'll keep you sober this weekend if you keep your attitude right. Wow. He says, because if you're mad at me, it's okay if you're mad at me. I don't care if you're mad at me. But as long as you stay sober, and not, he said, I'll keep you sober by just being mad at me. It worked. Wow. You know. You could have gotten offended and yeah. taken off. But I think being teachable is another thing. Not only listening, but being teachable and open to um, what God has to say and what others have to say. And one of the things I like, another thing I like about Celebrate Recovery is um, the people are very real, they're very genuine, and they're here to support each other. And that yes. is a beautiful thing. Yes. All right, well, Ted. Um, I, I, I just wanna add one sure. more thing to that. Please do. When the, the scary part about all this stuff is, is when we think we've got it figured out. Mm. And right. we don't, you never get this thing figured out. I, I wish I, I could just hand you a diploma and say you made it, but that's not how this works. And when you slack up and think that you've, you've got it all under control for yourself, look out, you're, you, you're in really bad situation. You better get on the phone and get to a lot of meetings because that's where I watch a lot of people drop is they think they got it and they right. don't. That's good. And I was going to ask you about that. What is it that helps people to fail, you know? And I think that's a big one. And that kind of goes along with pride. Oh, like, yeah, I already pride. know it. I already have the answers. I have it figured out. Um, so interesting. Um, in closing, Ted, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? I really appreciate you taking your time to uh, just share some of your story. And I, I love what God's done in your life. And I agree with what you said. If you write it down, I mean, when you're in the midst of a mess, you can't see clear to know what the possibilities are. Correct. I mean, if you would have told me 10, 20, 30 years ago that my life would be where it is today, I would have said, you're sorely mistaken. But yes. nothing is impossible for God. No, no, no. I mean, he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask for, imagine, or even think about. And if you just stay connected with him, wow amazing things can happen. Um, but do you have anything else to share as we end this session? Well, to end the way you were saying this, it's, it's kind of funny. I would never, ever think that I would be sitting here talking mm. to you. And uh, I hope everybody just, just listen and try to figure this thing out, you know, and just get help. You know, there's people like me all over that will be glad to help you. So, right. Um, and just pray. Find God and pray. Just keep praying all the time. Mm. That's probably the best advice I've got. Amen. Just something as simple as asking for help is huge and can yes. be the beginning of things turning around. And not everyone is local where we are, but if you get on the internet and type in Celebrate Recovery, you can find a local Celebrate Recovery, probably at a church near you or something similar. So, Ted, thank you again for coming. Thank you. Because, you know, you when... When you do this, it, it helps me just as much as it helps you guys. Right. Because it brings all everything back into my mind. And, and so it, it, it makes me uh, stronger with what I'm doing because we all have to stay strong. And you know that we have to stay strong. Absolutely. Well, in, so these, days, in these days we're living in just with a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear, um, we can get in our head about our challenges and then we have a conversation like we did today and it's like wow remembering 10 20 30 40 years ago ooh, <laughs> things are good aren't they <laughs> things are very very good they're not perfect yeah. um, but one day they will be yeah and that's exciting 
Yes, it so is. thank you, Todd, and God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for watching this episode of Voices of Recovery. We're creating a safe place where people can go to get support and encouragement on their journey with God. And if you're new to our page, please give us a like or a follow. We'd love to have you so that you don't miss any of this content because I interview somebody every week and I'm so glad to have Ted here with us today. And stay tuned for another episode of Voices of Recovery next week. And um, if you feel led, share this out or host a watch party because I believe that there's somebody that you know who needs to hear what Ted has to say. Thank you again for watching. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. God bless.